Hey, welcome to the Backyard Professor Live show. We are really excited for tonight. We have a fundamentally unique situation going on with American history and how it jives with early Mormon history. So let's get this show on the road. Holy cats, Batman, here we are. Hey, before we get started, I want to let you know I have Doug Vincent in the studio with me, our beloved Doug from chat, but I do have a couple of quick announcements I want to make real quick, and then we are going to share some doggone cool news and information with you tonight. I got to get my banners going here. I just need to let you guys know that... Which one is it? Yes, this one. I'm going to pop this up real quick. Uh, I have been adding other videos. Uh, this is my chess channel. And I am also spilling over on this channel with uh, BYP responds that are not going to be the same as on the Mormon discussion uh, because I can't just copy the video back and forth. Uh, YouTube won't let me because I do get paid from this site and my own. So I can respond to the same issue, but I have to do a separate, completely new video. Um, I am putting up some of my interviews with the scholars. I have a new Kobe Townsend interview on there and so on and so forth. And if you like chess, come on over. I'm doing chess also. So that will be some extra material. I will probably end up putting my uh, New Testament commentary videos on there and here as well. So there's the link. Go ahead and subscribe, hit the notification button, and then that way you get the best of both worlds. And I also want to let you know also that I have an enormous amount of new videos on my podcast where you get to listen instead of watch the video. If you're commuting back and forth to work, if you're working out in the yard, shoveling snow, whatever it is you're doing, if you're sitting home wanting to relax and just listen to something interesting, here are all of your listening uh, podcasts. Some of those are two and a half hours long. Some of them are 10 minutes. So I just have a brand new podcast up responding to Elder David A. Bednar as well. So I'm just letting you know, uh, I'm diversifying somewhat. There might be a little repeat information, but it's all for your total enjoyment. So come on over now. Can we get to the fun yet, Doug? How are you, my friend? Good, good. <laughs> Thanks you for having me on. <laughs> oh my, good pleasure! Thank you for coming on. We've been uh, we've been having a ball uh, putting yeah. this putting this thing together. Let me let me explain my end of things, and then yeah. I'll let you tell tell the audience how you kind of kept niggling me and saying, "Okay, hey, look what I found! Look what I found!" And I got more and more and more genuinely excited and amazed. So. I'm sitting there, it's, it's been just a couple of weeks ago, and Doug calls me on the phone, and he said, hey, uh, have you ever thought about the Erie Canal? Uh, 
which one did you listen to, Doug? The, um, not- it was it was about the Book of Enoch. That's right. Yeah. Oh, it was with Colby. It was yeah, with Colby yeah. Townsend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And he has some enormous, wonderful, updated information on the availability of Enoch to Joseph Smith. So Doug calls me on the phone and says, hey, dude, how you doing? And uh, hey, have you ever thought about the Erie Canal? And I go, no. <laughs> and he goes, well, uh, I, I've heard a couple things about it. Uh, it th- there's just a couple of items that intrigue me. And I looked into this and, and you told me a couple of things. I said, oh, yeah, man, yeah, that's interesting. A couple of days later, Doug's calling me back. And he's saying, Carrie, you've <laughs> got to listen to this video. You've got to watch this video on the yeah. Erie Canal. This is huge. And so I go, yeah, oh, okay, Doug, I will. I will. Uh, Doug's always guided me right. So within the next day or two, I listened to this video and my jaw dropped. Yeah. <laughs> go, wait a minute. What is it about this Erie Canal here? Well, through the last two weeks, I'm going to try hard not to exaggerate this. In the last two weeks, sincerely, I have learned more about the seriously high probability of Joseph Smith's environment truly getting him involved in everything to do with Mormonism than I ever learned in 45 years of Mormonism. I am totally stunned and very excited for tonight because with Doug, we get to show some really cool American genius history and how it dovetails perfect with Joseph Smith. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was one of those things where I, I saw that episode with Colby and you're talking about the the availability of the Book of Enoch. And just in the back of my mind, it's like, I remember something about a library barge on the Erie Canal or something like that. So I started researching it. And every time I <laughs> looked up another little phrase, I got more and more and more information. And it was just like, whoa, this is huge. I got to share this with Carrie. So yeah, so we, for two weeks, we've been going back and forth and, and sharing stuff and making slides and documents, and, and he invited me to come on, so here I am. <laughs> I, I think it would be fun if we could ever pull this off, and I, I'm sincerely serious. I'm going to try. Uh, I, wouldn't it be a ball to somehow set up a situation where several of us from chat, as well as you and I, can all go meet over there in New York and go down the Erie Canal together? Yeah. Yeah. Would that it would not be interesting? Be we yeah. can pick up Dan Vogel on the way. He's right <laughs> on the way. And uh, we could have him give us lectures on early Mormon history and all. I mean, that would, yeah, be, that would so be cool. Fun. We could take Radio Free Mormon with us to keep us entertained. Hey, it looks like Radio Free Mormon's here. Welcome, my oh, dear no. friend. <laughs> Bob Miller, Tim Rathbone, fine business operator. Great to see you again, my friend. Hey, I left your message on your phone. Uh, you know, call me back after the show. I didn't mean to ignore you. And uh, Dan Vogel and who else is here? Mosia. Good to see you. Tom Miller, Mosiah. Gail Capson, always good to see you. Nikki McBee, John Ross Barsky. Yeah, baby. Newton Lemnos, welcome. Yeah. Hey, he's saying you look like Santa Claus. You want to do a ho ho ho? No, no, no. The kids say that to me all the time. <laughs> I have to, I have to like duck and cover at Christmas time, you know. <laughs> hey, I go out of the house. <laughs> hey, listen, my guests, I go big. Yeah, <laughs> I got Santa Claus, the now. big man himself, right here. <laughs> no, That's actually, hilarious. Carrie, the the big man uh, on campus right here is. Baby Yoda. There you go. Look at that. Right now, over is, his shoulder. Now, since I'm not in the chat tonight, this is a warning. Anybody in the chat that 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 gets out of line, <laughs> Baby Yoda's going to force choke you. <laughs> Mark so Chris, everybody behave. Yeah, baby. Yeah, baby. <laughs> Try to do it. Oh, hey. You do that again. Yeah, baby. <laughs> there you go. A double whammy for you, Mark. We love you. born. There you go. So, okay. Hey, 
Uh, let, let's get on this. We sure. th This is just genuinely fascinating to me personally. And I know you as the audience are going to come away tonight saying stuff like, I didn't know that. Or, oh, now that makes sense. Why Joseph Smith did this or that or just that this is just so fun so anyway uh doug has put together now doug approached this in a way a little bit different than i did we will be getting to the missing book of enoch i so promise because that's a prominent part of this but doug has helped me see that there is more of a prominent part of this than just that missing wonderful scripture so he's got a presentation of the history of the geology and geography that helped me make sense of the Mormon movement, even believe it or not. So, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Doug for a bit. Let me, you ready uh, for me to turn you on, Chief? Uh, let's see, yeah, go for it. Hey, Nikki McBee, good to see you. Oh, Moksha Raver, love you, dude. You're awesome. Dan Vogel, I love you too. I love all of you guys, man. You're awesome. Okay, so here we go. Uh, Doug's going to give us some some really spectacular information here. All right. Can you see my slide? Yes. Can everybody see a slide? Yeah, it shows here. Okay, cool. good. So they're seeing what I'm seeing. So All right. So uh, let me just start off. This is the only way I knew to do this really quickly. And um I guess I'm a little old fashioned <laughs> uh, nah, PowerPoint slides, but whatever. Okay. So uh, what I want to do is uh, I want to start all the way back in the ice age. All right. We need to well, go back. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Ryan Larson and T.O. Sorry to interrupt you. I got to welcome my two. Oh, no, yeah. really good dear so welcome. Thank you for showing up. You're going to love this show. Oh, Paula Edens. Yes. Thank you for showing. Okay. Okay. I got to quit doing that. Okay. You're up chief. <laughs> All right. Boy. So here we go. So about two and a half million years ago, um, the ice ages started and these huge ice sheets started covering uh, Canada and, and parts of uh, the United States. Um, now this is not just a little bit of ice. We're talking over two miles thick ice and it mainly affected Canada, but it did push down into the lower 48 a little bit. And it stopped about where New York City is, by the way. Uh, and it went all the way across uh, to, um, uh, to the Puget Sound over in Washington, where RFM is, is uh, from. So anyway, th these ice sheets, these, they kind of came down and receded multiple times over the period of, of these millions of years. And the last ice age... Uh, started ending about 18,000 years ago. And when it did, it had stopped at right where New York City is right now. And when it receded, I'm going to go over these slides just a little bit here. When it receded, it left us a present, okay? And that present is called Long Island. <laughs> um, so... <laughs> <laughs> so as you can see down here, uh, there's a little, can you see my mouse moving down here? Yeah, you're, you're, okay. you're hanging around that colored box. Can you enlarge that a little bit? Well, the colored box is right here. That's what's up here above it. Okay. Oh, okay. So, so this is, yeah. So this is Log Island. All right. Okay. The purple stuff that you're seeing here, that is called a moraine, a glacial moraine. And, and that is formed when the ice starts to melt all of the rocks and dirt and everything else that have accumulated in that glacier start dropping out as it melts. And it, and it leaves these humongous, these are hundreds of feet tall. Uh, you see there's oh, two wow. of them here on, on Long, Long Island. It leaves these giant mounds, okay? Uh, and it also, uh, the finer material um, gets washed out and it creates floodplains. And all this yellow stuff underneath the rest of Long Island, those are all floodplains. So you have two moraines and these floodplains where all this stuff bas basically precipitated out. Uh, then down here in the in this red box, that's what this is up here that uh, in the upper part here is like a zoom in. So you see Manhattan here, you see yeah. Brooklyn, and here's that purple kind of glacial moraine coming across. 
Um, right here where it says the narrows, um, that was another little gift. Um, uh, this was kind of formed a natural dam as things melted, this huge lake filled up behind it. And there was a cataclysmic flood where the, the water broke through this, this narrows and it carved out this beautiful channel here. Uh, this nice and deep. Uh, the, the glacier also uh, scraped all of the soil off of Manhattan uh, all the way down to bedrock. And that's why you can actually build skyscrapers in Manhattan is because it's all bedrock. So it'll support those big buildings. Oh, I've always wondered that. No kidding. Yeah, yeah. So you Aren't don't see as much. All those tons of steel is going to sink. Yeah, wow. exactly. Yeah, well, it's all, all on solid rock right here. Now you get over here in uh, Long Island, and you don't have that. It's all this gravelly stuff in those those floodplains. Yeah. yeah. So you can't do it there. Okay. Now <clears throat> let me go back down here to the bottom. You see this little blue uh, area coming up here. This is the Hudson River, River Valley. The uh, the ice sheets and the glaciers also carved out the Hudson River Valley. And the Hudson River Valley is going to be really important for this story. Uh, it's, it carved it so deep that it's actually tidal. So, uh, you know, the ocean basically backs up into the river. Uh, sometimes they even find sharks and stuff in the river. So it's kind of interesting. Um, <clears throat> one final thing that the, uh, the ice sheets left it, uh, in New York for our story uh, is another thing called a drumlin. So a dr what a drumlin is, is uh, if you think of, if you've ever seen somebody plowing the ground, when the plow goes through the ground, the dirt kind of peels away on each side of it. You know, and that's what makes your, your furrows, okay? Uh, and so when these ice sheets would come down, that you know, it wasn't like a, a solid wall. It would be like fingers of ice coming down. And they would just basically plow the ground. And in upstate New York... Uh, they have these long, loaf-shaped uh, hills, and they're called a drumlin. And the, the uh, Hill Camorra is a drumlin, okay? Oh. Yeah. So really? anyway, the, uh, the ice sheets finally stopped coming down, and then uh, we got one final gift. Uh, and that final gift was dirt. So what happened is to poor old Canada... All these, these uh, ice sheets coming and going and two miles thick, that kind of thing, it just literally plowed up all the ground in Canada and mushed it around all the topsoil. It ground rock down into fine powder and it created kind of a new substance. And when it melted away, there were huge piles of this left. And where did those piles go? Well, the wind blew them all down here. <laughs> And you can see on this little map oh, over here to the right. On the right. Oh, yeah. yeah. So so uh, this is called Loess, okay? That's the name of the dirt, called Loess. And the wind blew all the Loess from Canada down into the United States. And in some places, like in this dark area, 15 feet deep. Oh, and wow. This, and Loess is the richest soil on the earth. So we got this amazing gift. And you can see it goes from Ohio and it covers covers all the Midwest, right? I hope the Canadians don't want that back. I'm not going to offer to give any back, but you can. <laughs> I'll, I might send them a little bitty vial of it about that big, okay? Huh. All right. So That's a so lot of dirt, though, yeah. Something yeah. only glaciers could give us. Fascinating. Yeah, so so all this is important to know, though, folks, uh, to get to the juicy stuff that we're going to get to in a little bit. All right, so let's go to the next slide. Yep. All right, so here we are, modern day, or, or let's just say we're back in the 1800s. Um, here's the eastern United States. Uh, one of the problems back when this country was founded is that this this Appalachian chain, the brown stuff here on the on this left hand map acted as a giant wall. So people who wanted to get from the East Coast over more into the middle of the country uh, had a tough time. There were literally only five places where you could go from the East Coast into the interior of the United States. 
And each one of those would take two to three weeks by oxen, okay? Two to three weeks. There, with, there's only one up here in this red, and I've got an, uh, kind of a zoomed-in map of, of New York over here. Mm -hmm. There's only one place where there was a cut through the mountains from east to west, and that's up here in New York, in this little red square here. And if we come down here to New York, this bigger map of New York, you can see where that green strip is right there. This is the Mohawk River, and it cuts through the mountains. That's the only place. It was still a two to three week journey to go from here over to the Great Lakes. Okay. The other thing is that we have the Hudson River. See the Hudson River coming down here? And what's down at the bottom? Ta-da! Long Island and New York and Manhattan and all that, okay? Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the glaciers had carved out the Hudson River Valley. They had created Long Island. They had created this amazing harbor system, you know, that was just perfect for harbors and everything. And, and, um, and then there's this convenient little pass-through to the West, although it wasn't that convenient yet, okay? We'll get to how it became convenient. No. All right, so uh, what you're seeing now, this is uh, a traffic jam in the eight, early 1800s, okay? <laughs> and you notice that every vehicle in this picture is being pulled by something that poops. <laughs> oh, okay. good point. Yeah. Oh. So, so let's talk about the state of the roads the state of the roads at this period of time, well, basically, there were no what we would consider roads. They were all dirt trails. The only place where there is even a semblance of a road were in the big cities like Boston or New York, where they had some, and I... Uh-oh, you froze up, Doug. You might be sitting too... Oh. Here's what happened to those roads when it rained. Okay, they, hold they, on. You're, oh, you froze up for about ten to fifteen seconds there. Oh, don't don't I, sit so close to your mic. Okay. 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 okay repeat what you just said two okay. minutes ago. So, <laughs> so the only the only paved streets were paved with cobblestones, and those were in like Boston or New York or Philadelphia, that kind of thing, and only a few of those streets. Almost every street, all the other streets in the United States were just dirt. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, when it rained, it would turn into a crack, uh, quagmire of mud and made traveling sure. almost impossible. Uh, plus, it was miserable for the people riding in these uh, you know, wagons or carriages or even on horseback. Yeah. Mud Good splattering time. everywhere, manure splattering everywhere. Oh. When it was dry, you imagine uh, it was rock thing? hard. There were ruts and bumps. Uh, none of these things had much of a suspension system in them, so the the, the riding was just horrible, and um, and it was dusty, just dust everywhere. So traveling was kind of a nightmare back then. So um, what happened is the idea for the Erie Canal uh, came about from a guy named uh, Jesse Hawley. And he was a flour merchant, like not flowers as in pretty flowers, but as, as in make bread flour. And he lived in New York and he literally went broke trying to uh, raise his wheat, grind it and send it to the East Coast for export or for sale. Um, the, the expense of giving, getting it over the Appalachian Mountains was so much that he just couldn't make any money. And he wound up going to debtor's prison, which back then, if you went into debt and you couldn't pay your bills, they threw you in prison and they allowed you to work it off while you're in prison. While he's in prison, uh, while he was in prison, he uh, started writing some letters that talked about an idea to, uh, you know, have a canal go across that nice little Mohawk River Valley and that that would solve the problem of the transportation. And that got picked up by the newspapers and by politicians. And uh, after some bantering about in which uh, the mayor of New York, who loved the idea, went to uh, Thomas Jefferson, the president, and 
uh, uh, presented him with the idea and Thomas Jefferson said that it was insane. So no federal money, but eventually that same politician, um, uh, his name was, uh, let's see, what was that guy's name? Uh, hang on, let me look, refer to my stuff. Oh, Clinton. Yes, Clinton. Clinton, yeah. DeWitt Clinton. De DeWitt Clinton. DeWitt. Uh, he eventually became uh, a senator, a New York state senator. And while he was senator, he was able to get them to pass an act to fund this uh, canal project. Uh, and he got $7 million, which is just a huge amount of money back then. Everybody wow. thought he was insane. Uh, his critics called it uh, uh, Clinton's big ditch. Okay. Uh, and then they had kind of another problem. Uh, the other problem they had was that they did not have any experienced civil engineers in the United States. Now, there had never been a civil engineering project in the United States. So, you know, what are they going to do? So they got to, believe it or not, two judges who worked on a lot of land surveying cases and a math teacher. And these are the guys that planned out and devised a way to build the Erie Canal. Okay. Uh, and they, they wound up sending a, a kind of an understudy guy to Europe to study how the Europeans had done their canals. And he came back with some information. Uh, and also another really cool little piece of information that we'll give you later about locks. Okay. So, uh, Next slide here. So um, they mapped out the path of the Erie Canal, and um, this is where they were going to go, through that pass and then over to Lake Erie here. And, and right here at the end is where Buffalo is. That's where Buffalo, New York is. Uh, all these little lines are called locks. Those are uh, like gates that will open and close on each end. That you can let the water come in and fill it up, and it'll lift your boat up to a higher level, and then you can go across. And that's how they climbed this uh, down here at the bottom. You see, see the the upper elevation here is Lake Erie, and it steps down all the way 586 feet down to Albany. Oh um, wow! The Hudson River. So they had to drop the or lift the the boats uh that height and over a distance of uh 363 miles so quite an engineering feat quite an engineering feat no nope, everybody thought they were crazy but yeah. there they were they're going for it what's that little black box there doug the black box Rectangle. is almira new york right oh here. oh okay so that shows yeah. the height at palmyra oh how yeah. cool that's the elevation of Palmyra. There were two locks at Palmyra. That you could drop about 15 feet per lock, and there was a 20 foot drop at Palmyra, so it took two, uh, two, two locks. Okay. Yeah, I heard the canal was only. I, I say only. <laughs> Glad I didn't have to hand dig it, but uh, it was uh, like 40 feet wide and only four feet deep. Yeah, yeah, yes. it was surprisingly Lots. shallow. Surprisingly shallow. Yeah. So uh, they started building uh, on July 4th, 1817. They started at Rome, New York, and they went both directions. Rome, New York is, you know, somewhere in the middle here, I guess. And they went both directions. OK, so it took till 1825 to complete it. From Albany all the way to Buffalo, but um, they reached Palmyra in 1822. 1817, by the way, is the same year that Joseph Smith's family moved to Palmyra. Yeah, I was going to say, um, yeah, that's that's yeah. significant. Yep, yep. Yep. The, the last section here uh, where Buffalo is, uh, that took the longest. That took three years. And the reason for that is because there's, there's a giant cliff. It's called the Niagara Escarpment. And it was 80 feet high. And they had to uh, cut through solid rock. Yeah. To get to step the the canal down all the way down that escarpment uh, to Lake Erie, okay. So that was uh, took took the longest, but um, in 1825 they opened it up for business and Travisimo things changed. All right, that's my slideshow.
that that is spectacular. Yeah, I guess the uh, those locks at the end at Buffalo, uh, they had like eight or nine of them, didn't they? Yeah, they had they had a number of them in in Buffalo. Yeah, yeah. because it had to go down so many uh, yeah. so much, and they yeah. had to cut through solid rock, and and also they had to they had to get water to the canal. I mean, they're digging through solid rock. Well, there's no water, so they also okay. had to cut a waterway so that there's water in all that rock, basically, you know, so they could do their up yeah. flooring and, and raising. So, yeah. So, so all of a sudden you have this new canal and it's the first major uh, was the first public works project, literally in the United States, yeah. other than, other than it was bridges about. here and there. And, yeah. you know, nobody had done anything. No, civil engineering wise you know, amateurs think. yeah yeah and it was I the longest to... canal in the world yeah yeah and it yeah. and it became one of the great wonders of the entire united states absolutely it just yeah. blew everybody away i wanted to say hi to debbie joe also hi debbie well, joe. Hi, Debbie. thank you glad you came all my Get friends hi <laughs> yeah all my friends woohoo so so what uh what we've done here now what we want to do uh, we want to, I, I've, I, I've never learned so much about this part of American history as this last two weeks. I have been watching video after video after video. I have been reading online scholar material on the Erie Canal, etc. And I, we have found some really cool clips. And what we're going to do is we're going to show you a clip and then Doug and I are going to talk about it a little bit because we might overlap a little bit and all, but th this is just so overwhelmingly spectacular when we finally arrive at the real broadened significance. And we will see that the, and, and this is not our goal. And yet in a way it dovetails in. What we want is just just give us the information and the history, please. The church wants to narrow it down and give us something faith-promoting. I get that. Doug gets that. Okay, all well and good. But they leave too much out. <laughs> and let, let, Let's go to this first slide, shall we, Doug? We'll see. So let's take a look here. It's many miles to Buffalo, oh, that low bridge. A trip that could have taken six weeks before the canal now took less than one week and cost one-tenth of an overland trip. So as soon as it opened, the canal was overwhelmed with traffic and it paid for itself with tolls in just 10 years. So, Doug, that's pretty fast to pay it off that indicates to me that they began using it right now and yeah. they used it yeah. night and day you were telling me right they didn't stop oh, yeah. The night. yeah see that was one of the that was one of the events so now so imagine what i talked about earlier about transportation okay yeah oxen and all this other stuff mud and mud yeah. nasty stuff Okay, taking weeks to get over the mountains. Now you could just do it in a week or or, or, or it, depending on where you're going, it could just be a few days. But you could get over those mountains very easily. The other thing is that the, the uh, canal operated day and night. Whereas yeah. if you're traveling by, with animals, you had to stop and water them and feed them, and blah, 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 you know, and you had to camp for the night. So this was uh, an all day, all night kind of thing. So that sped things up. Uh, also, you're, you're floating, you know, there's no bumpy roads, there's no dust. Oh, it's good just, point. Yeah, it's just smooth. So yeah, you're not on the ocean, there's no floating. waves, there's no waves. It's just smooth. The whole thing is just smooth, okay? So all of a sudden you have this dream method of transportation compared to the other types of transportation they had at the time, you know, this was like a dream come true. It was, it was two-way. You could do both yeah. do go up and down. People could be coming up and down at the same time. Okay. So you wasn't you'd have to wait for everybody to come down and then go up. You just did it, you know. Um, and uh, 
the most important thing was that uh, that little clip about the cost. The cost. Yeah. One tenth. Did that clip say that? Well, let me, let me give you an idea. Let's let's go back to that the the ox pulled cart scenario right. that they had before. Right. Okay, that team of oxen could pull about twenty two hundred pounds in a wagon. Okay, so one team of oxen, twenty two, a little over a ton. Okay, one horse on the Erie Canal could pull a barge with sixty thousand pounds. On it. Oh come on! Yeah, sixty thousand pounds. Thousand pounds. Yeah, sixty thousand pounds. So thirty times as much as that ox cart, and, wow. and do it with just one horse. Okay, and what they did so along the along the Erie Canal, and there's actually a few of these that are still there. You know, kind of, you know, they're all shot basically. But um, along the canal, they're, they're really smart the way they did this. So along the, you know, you have the canal and then along the canal, right beside it is a trail. Okay. And that's mm -hmm. where the animals would walk and they'd be tied up to the barge and they would be pulling the barge. Okay. But every 15 miles they had a stable and, you know, barns and whatever. So they would change out the horse. So they keep oh. the horse fresh or the mule or whatever animal they were using. There you right? go. Yeah. yeah. So they and then they, they would just keep on going. OK, so it was a beautiful little system they had worked out. And all of a sudden, you know, the cost of shipping, the time and the, the actual cost just. Oh, the cost. Plummeted. The cost was so 90%. much. That's yeah, incredible. 90%. That is incredible. Yeah. All right. Let's go to this next clip. Ten years over 100 years old. John McKee operates the locks in Lockport, New York. Sometimes there was a day or two wait just to get through the locks. Boats would be packed up on both sides of the, the banks right here. And of course, while they were lined up waiting to go through, they would spend their time and money in town here and that to added to the population here in Lockport. Population grew in towns all along the canal. Rochester, New York Mayor Lovely Warren traces the beginnings of her city to the. Yeah, I cut that off on purpose because yeah. what, what what really uh, caught my eye, and this this whole video is well done. Uh, what really caught my eye, oh, and the name of that video is 200 Years on the Erie Canal." Sorry, I was going to say that, but fun little video. It's a it's a. Uh, one of those documentary specials it's only like 17 minutes wonderful to watch but uh, what caught my attention here was again you had mentioned the two-way traffic but that at some time the traffic was so heavy that it sometimes took two days for them to get to that lock what are you going to do for that time yeah go to the city yeah. So this kind of was a huge boom for the city. Yeah. Well, let me let me talk a little bit about cities, okay? Because I, I think it's important. You don't freeze. You're oh, too close. Okay. To, yeah, there you go. Okay. I know. So, I, do, I do that. I have too. to lean in. <laughs> I, I had wonderful friends who told me, okay, BYP, you're getting the hang of this electronics. Now, will you scoot your ugly face back? So that... <laughs> you, don't, you don't want to see up my nose, do you? Okay. I don't um, care. I'm 62 so, now. It doesn't matter. So, so just a just a couple of things about cities and things that uh, just to enrich this little scenario. Um, cities um, yeah. at the time in 1817, when um, Joseph Smith's family moved to Palmyra, Palmyra, New York, had 2,200 people in it. Okay, so it was not. So you know, it wasn't it. 2,200 people. 2,200 people. It was not like a super fly spec town. It was a respectable site. For that period of time, that was, let's compare that. At the same time, in Chicago, Chicago had less than 100 people in it. Okay. What? Yeah. So what? Get, no. Okay, yeah. wait, wait. Chicago. Chicago. So it hadn't even developed yet, apparently. No, it wasn't even a town. It was just a spot on a map with oh, less wow. than 100 people. Yeah. So, that uh, it's hard for us to think about it, but I mean, this really was a frontier, folks. Um, the the um, 
Uh, Carrie, could you put me back on? I want to share that that slide of the United States again here. So, Absolutely. Okay. So, <clears throat> so the this area, Michigan, you can't see Wisconsin. It's over here. Uh, Indiana, Illinois, and Ohio. At that at Joseph Smith's time, that was called the Northwest Territory. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow yeah, the north the northwest territory uh when joseph smith moved to palmyra new york in the entire northwest territory all of those states that what we now can call states all of that there were less than forty five thousand people in that entire area oh. that's how sparsely populated it was um when joseph smith moved to palmyra new york florida still belonged to Spain. So did the Western United States. It belonged oh, to Spain. Right. Uh, the Midwest, you know, Missouri, Nebraska, all that, Kansas, that was part of the Louisiana Purchase, which had just been made maybe, you know, 15 years earlier. So right. that was all territory, un, unorganized, oops, sorry, unorganized okay. land, etc. So this, I mean, this was really, the frontier it really was. Um, yeah, yeah, no kidding, yeah. right? Yeah. So fast. for Palmyra, for Palmyra to have two thousand people in it was a a, a big deal. Yeah, um, yeah, that's, that's yeah. fascinating. Oh, uh, I love that map you had. That that's awesome. That's yeah. Fun. Okay, back we are. So, what's next? Let's, let's go to the next slide. But the canal also accelerated the western expansion of the nation. People and commerce were able to reach and develop what would become the American Midwest. A region that was isolated and landlocked was now connected via the canal and the Hudson River down to New York City and the world. Now, Kaboom. Now <laughs> this, yeah, kaboom. this was really fun for me to to hear and watch and learn about because I, I have honest this shows you how much I paid attention to American history in school. Not that they tried to teach it much to me because I was in the ancient stuff. But um, I, I sometimes have wondered through the years, why why did New York become so dad blame big, you know? Now it's starting to make sense yeah. because New York, once they finished that Erie Canal, it connected not only to the UK, but to all the rest of the, that's why all those yeah. big towns got raised on the Great Lakes. I, I know there's probably people here who say, yeah, no dub backyard professor. You're about as thick as a brick. Well, I am, but that's what made this history so delicious to learn. Talk yeah. about fun now see this is actually the first gold rush in america right here now it wasn't a rush for gold gold it was a rush for black gold remember when i talked about the low west and all that super rich soil yeah that is what people were after that's what they wanted you cannot grow a nation with people just subsistence farming and feeding their own families you know, who's going to feed all the people in the cities and stuff? You know, you want a hugely uh, successful and thriving agricultural industry in your country so that you can feed everybody, you can export it, blah, 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 you know. And yeah. you had this, this sweet spot in, in that Northwest Territory there that we talked about with this incredibly rich soil and... It was just sitting there ready for people to come take it. Come and down. as soon as that corridor opened up, it was, it was kaboom. It was like the floodgates open. You talked about the, uh, the canal. Um, mm -hmm. The city of Palmyra made $80,000 in tolls the first year the canal was open. The city of Palmyra. <laughs> wow. This little town, 80 grand. That was huge back then. That was yes. huge. Yeah, that was yeah. huge. That, yeah, that's that was huge. a million dollars, you know, so. Wow. All right, All right, let's check out this next slide. Within a year or two, there were already calls of, hey, let's make it bigger. And they did. 
By 1862, the canal was almost twice as wide and twice as deep. People and goods and ideas flowed 24 hours a day in both directions. The impact that the internet has had on our culture and our society is very similar to the impact that the canal had. Sharing ideas, making things faster, Yep. Yeah, I, I love that clip because um, th the comparison is that because as you and I were researching this and studying it from day one, and this is one thing I want the audience to understand seriously, it did not take them two or three or four years to get this canal hopped up with business mm -hmm. from day one, blam everybody began using this thing. It was actually, partially, it was partially built and they were partially using it on the one side before they actually finished it. But once they finished yeah. it, no kidding, we're talking hundreds, if not thousands of barges on this thing, day and night, all going both directions, exchanging goods, exchanging services. And most important for our discussion tonight exchanging information incidentally i would like to add since he is here dan bogle is in the audience hey dan. Uh, i yeah hey dan i i called dan and and i asked him about this erie canal and then doug you later confirmed this to me um I'll say it and then you can give your quick spiel. But Dan told me, you know, yeah, you guys are thinking correctly about the serious and gigantic overarching, not only in distance, but in time and intensity of the influence of the interchange and exchange of ideas in Palmyra. Joseph Smith wasn't the country hick boy the church wants us to think about emma was the country girl now yes. that was quite a i go oh wow that's an interesting adjustment she didn't live in a town on the erie canal joseph smith yeah did. yeah it was a huge huge uh, influence um I have something from the uh, Palmyra, Palmyra Herald of June 9th, 1822 to read. Would you let me yeah, do that? Absolutely. Okay. Love it. So, so as, as BYP was saying, the Erie Canal, it opened officially in 1825. But as soon as they got sections opened, people started using it. They didn't wait. Okay. Plus, you had all the construction going on, all these people moving in, thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of people working on this canal. So... Right from the beginning, 1817, that whole area was being inundated with people that were starting to work on this canal. Here's in 1822, Palmyra Herald. Our village has assumed an appearance which may be justly considered characteristic of the elevated rank to which it is destined. The canal crosses Main Street at the eastern end where there is a large and commodious basin. Now, a basin was kind of like a train station. It was like this wide place in the canal where they could pull the barges and boats over and dock them and let the people get off or put new stuff on. Okay. So they mm -hmm. could get out of the line of traffic, you know, do their stuff. Then later they could get back in. So that's what a basin is. Okay. Uh, a large and commodious basin and nearly opposite the center of the village, another basin is now completed. Plus at the end of the village is a third basin directly opposite to which there's an elegant dry dock. So they were they're, more they're than bragging. proud. They're there. That's our canal. We you got guys got to come to our place. It, this is we where it's are it. <laughs> We are going to invent the pool table in the bar sink. That's right. <laughs> How interesting. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. that's fun stuff. Okay. Uh, one other Let's go to this next one. Let's keep trucking. We're, we're yeah. doing good on time. Truck away. The first women's rights convention was held in Seneca Falls, a canal town. And Joseph Smith started the Mormon religion in Palmyra, along the shores of the canal. When I saw that, I, I realized, you know, uh, 
the world knows more about the environment of, of early Mormonism than I do, than I did mm -hmm. as an apologist. But that is a very important connection. What I want to do, uh, I was going to put that one slide in early. That's that okay. That's okay. We'll just keep going. We, we've got some fun stuff to share. With. Let, let's keep going on the on I, the impact of this. Huh? Yeah, I was going to say one thing about that is, oh, is sure. because we're talking about all the women stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. So what, what the canal did socially to these people um, is you had literally overnight this flood of people coming in both directions down this canal of all different backgrounds, different religions, dis different socioeconomic statuses. You had people from overseas coming in. You had the, the future king of France go down it. You had Charles Dickens go down it. Um, uh, Niagara Falls is just a few miles north of Buffalo. Uh, oh, Buffalo is cool. at the end of the of the canal, cool. and it became it was considered one of the wonders of the world, and it became the first true uh, major sightseeing uh, spot in the United States. It was like everybody wanted to see it. So you had this huge crush of people, okay, yeah. and it, it compressed all of these ideas. And all of the, the, these thoughts together in a way that they would never have been normally. Okay. Wow. It's more like the, the kind of thing that would happen in a big city. But it was happening in this little it tiny wise back town. Miles. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All along this canal, on all these little towns, this all was happening. So it was a huge social changer. Okay. Like Very they mentioned, the women's suffrage and things like that. Yeah. Huge social change. The story of the Erie Canal is filled with superlatives. America's greatest civil engineering feat, the ditch that built America, and the world's longest and most successful canal. In 1825, the Erie opened America's Midwest to settlement and development of New York as the Empire State, first in population, wealth, and resources. Cargo and passengers crowded canal boat decks. Less obvious, but no less essential, was the Erie Canal's role as the information highway of its day. It transported ideas of social change across the state, across the nation, and even the Atlantic Ocean. The canal's contributions, including helping shape America's vision as a nation where all men and women are created equal with equal rights, or why the canal today yeah, and, and they go off into, as I was looking through several of these different uh, wonderful videos to get a lot of these clips that was of high interest, I, I was searching more for the, the impact of the exchange of information. We've still got some fantastic clips to show you on this because that's directly pertinent to this book of Enoch. Uh, this wipes out Hugh Nibley's apologetic that one, nobody was interested in it, and two, it was not available. Those are the old days. The, that is just not true at all anymore. And now we have discovered Doug brought it to my attention and we have both been pursuing this through videos and books and all. Uh, we've discovered that this is a new day. Uh, Mormonism has to update. Now, Here's the thing, Doug. Did you ever hear very much about the Erie Canal and how it affected all these towns that Joseph Smith and the early Mormons were involved in in church? No, nope, not a word. Not one word. Not one word. I didn't either. Never heard of it. I feel ripped off in a way because not only is this fantastically interesting American history, but it definitely influences the early Mormon stuff in fabulous, significant ways. For instance, Joseph Smith's idea, and if I'm wrong, please correct me here, but I'm going to go out on a limb here slightly. Joseph Smith's theme of, of, uh, putting together a female relief society. And, and yeah, I know this was later on in the church. I get that. But the theme, the idea of a woman's organization separate, uh, this is going to be important. Oh, no, I'm starting. 
Hold on. You okay? I'm going to put these up. Did that help? Can you yes, still hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Um, th this thing that women deserve their own groups. Why? Well, technically unique to Joseph Smith. Now, once I saw this and, and saw all the social change, all the the um, initiatives for social changes that happened in that area, uh, a lot of it was uh, around women, you know, and th that wasn't unique. I always thought that the Relief Society was like this totally unique thing that n there had been nothing before that, you know, that women were just this second class and they didn't have any representation and they didn't have any organizations. And, and it was like, wait a second. And Joseph's about this right now. first one to put that into action. Yeah, that's yeah, that's what I thought. Now, that might be my own ignorance of American history, but I didn't, it you is. know. Yeah, I, but I just didn't. I always thought that you know, release, the Relief Society was this unique thing that he did, and it wasn't really that unique. Because you see it right here. We just saw it. Yeah. Um, it's reverbing like crazy. What the heck? They said they told me plug it in the mic or the <laughs> looks like you're gonna be doing the talking, pal. Let's do another video I, real quick. We can hear you. I know, but it's reverbing, they're saying. I'm echoing, yeah. Okay. Thank you. We'll see. Let's do a video. Hopefully it's not reverbing. Okay. The Erie Canal was a great uh, social space, a great early social space in the uh, in the United States because it um, it's it's like the internet is today. I think it's it created not just, of course, a social network, but an economic infrastructure for people up and down the canal. Um, it, it people shared ideas, they shared practices. It was a, it was a gathering space. Of course, it was a place that people came together, but it was a it was a place that uh, ideas traveled. They traveled up and down the canal, and of course, ideas are never disembodied things they're always connected to either people and word of mouth or to media printing presses are being shipped up and down the canal uh, every little hamlet as uh, Alexis de Tocqueville talks about every little hamlet in the United States has its own you know newspaper and this was true of course along the canal so different ideas spread through these media and the newspapers were being left on canal boats and you'd go you know the Albany paper would go up one direction and someone in Buffalo would pick it up and read it some of those ideas revolved around social reforms, ideas shared in conversations within the canal's floating community of immigrants from Europe and Americans seeking new opportunities, abolitionism, temperance, new forms of religious expression, utopian communities, and especially women's rights, all found fertile ground in the canal corridor. Yeah. Do we still have a reverb issue? That some are saying yes, some are saying no. I'm going to unplug this and see. Hopefully it won't reverb. It is a little bit not bad. Um, my, my theme here that I wanted to echo is, boy, it's reverbing like crazy. God damn it. They promised this would fix it. I'm going to plug it back in. The fascinating thing here that really impressed me was this theme of uh, now I've lost my trend of thought because I'm worried about the ideas, re sharing ideas, huh? Sharing ideas, <laughs> sharing ideas. Yeah, the 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 influx of ideas and how it changed everyone's status. It changed everyone's education so it is true joseph smith had a third grade education but it is not true formally but it is not true that he stayed there right i loved how that showed the printing presses on every single in every single Absolutely. little and, and they put a printing press on one of the barges and it went up and down yeah. now printing news now you told me something about the printing of the book of mormon why don't you describe what you yeah did? so 
Yeah, so this allowed everybody to have this printing press basically in their own backyard, right? Um, the, and yet, like you said, all these little towns had newspapers. The barges would take all the publications up and down, share them. Uh, somebody in, in Palmyra could be reading the New York newspaper in five days. So, uh, you know, it just, it was like they said, it was like their, the internet superhighway of their day. Um, but what I found interesting is that the printing press for the Book of Mormon, it, when Grandin uh, bought that printing press, it was the top of the line printing press available in his day. And it came up the canal on a barge. It weighed 1,500 pounds. No problem for a barge, you know. Smooth sailing, you know, a uh, lot less, uh, uh, you know, uh, chance of it getting messed up on some horrible ruddy road pulled by oxen, right? So, Warm. yeah, so boom, he, get, he gets his printing press. So that's one thing. Uh, so in, in this tiny little town, you have the absolute latest equipment latest technology, right? But then the other thing is they printed 5,000 copies of the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon, all that printing had to be done by hand, basically. You know, uh, I mean, all the, the handling of the paper, you had to have 5,000 books worth of paper. You had to have sheepskin to cover the cover. You had to have thread to sew the bindings. You had to have all this stuff. And you had to have the the workers and Grandin had nine people working six days a week, 12 hours a day on the Book of Mormon printing. So where did all that come from? Well, I, that all came because the Erie Canal made it possible. It that, that, that is absolutely so made that possible. Fascinating. See all this, all this little stuff that you've, you, you kind of go, well, that doesn't quite jive or whatever, you know, the Erie Canal makes it all come together in such an interesting and, way. And, and by the way, the Erie Canal runs directly in back of Grandin's store. <laughs> so if you go oh, there today, really? you can see the Erie Canal goes right behind his store. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. So he's out there barbecuing hamburgers. And when they stop by, they say, put that in the building and come and have a burger <laughs> with you. How interesting. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's, that's fantastically interesting. Let's go to this next clip and see what we find here. These are so much fun. I, I can't tell you how much fun I had researching this subject, man. The canal rocked the foundations of social life, not just in upstate. You had an influx of strangers, but you reached out for new pillars to grab onto. It's no surprise that people reached out to religion or other reform movements or other type of communal activities to kind of reestablish that connection in society. The did, did that stupid dictionary thing pop up on the screen? Did you see that video? No, I mean, I, the, the All right. fine. yeah. All right, good, good. So, so again, the interesting impact of this silly canal, this wonderful canal, my impression that we're dealing with uh, relatively isolated people who really didn't know how to spell the word corn every now and then getting together with the neighbor from 30 miles away and finally catching up on what little bit of news they had access to. All of that church narrative is out the door yeah. these guys are in a megatropolis that's 368 miles long for that time i say for that, that time. time yeah With and there were age. barges going up and down that sold books um they had they had a museum barge that had antiquities on it you know um every time every town had those uh places where the the boats could pull over people could get out and they would go into the shops and stuff in that town and people kept it loaded with the latest stuff. So it was, uh, it was up to date. Um, I bet you could find just about anything along the canal. If you wanted yeah. it, you could find it. That is such a new view compared to what I've had in my head yeah. my whole life about this time and area. Yeah. So, all right, let's take another look at another one. 
The women's rights movement really took off in upstate New York as part of a whole series in, of reform movements and religious revivals. It was so dramatic in upstate New York that people called it the burned over district or the burnt district. And it really happened in, in an explosive way after the Erie Canal came through with religious revivals and uh, con conversions to churches. I think the Erie Canal was the greatest human artifact to create new religious movements rapidly in the whole of history. You have the rise of uh, the Mormons. Uh, Joseph Smith prints the Book of Mormon, begins the, the, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in that time. Uh, the rise of spiritualism, the Fox Sisters over in Rochester and sort of buffeted by a number of uh, theological ideas. Uh, you've got the Adventists growing up uh, out of the Albany uh, tradition, so today Seventh-day Adventism. Um, as uh, one of the continually growing uh, traditions in, in, within, within Christianity, or religious traditions anywhere. One of the results of the canal and the railroads also, but was the ex real interest in utopian communities, separate communities. And part of their thought was, we want radical change, we want it now, and we want it non-violently. And the only way to do that is just set up our own little community with the kinds of social and economic rules we want, we choose. And one of the most famous was, of course, Ann Lee's Shaker communities, which spread out through the country, uh, northeast into Kentucky. Uh, the Oneida communities was settled near Utica by John Humphrey Noyes. All of them, in some way, made a different kind of relationship between women and men as a central component of their of their new ideas uh, okay seriously doug listen <laughs> uh there's your mormonism all in a nutshell in between 1825 and 1830 that was going on everywhere yeah i mean i mean that's talking about everything joseph smith was about in mormonism yeah different, different i thought it was an Mormon. isolated event that was that mm -hmm. came by revelation from heaven only to the mormons yeah uh, economics you talked about that remember the kirtland yeah. banks banking society relief society we talked about that utopian societies you know where they had the law of a law of consecration the whole nine yards. Zion, but, the new Jerusalem. Zion. And then in the burned over district, vi everybody was having visions, you know, all this religious excitement. I read one interesting article that said that um, one of the things that kind of contributed to this was that since they were kind of on the frontier, you know, this just explosion westward, it's like all of a sudden they were far removed from the potentates and and pilgrims that kind of had had ruled their churches back east, you know, and now they're in this kind of free area. And so they felt very, uh, you know, liberated in trying new ideas and, and new ways of thinking about things. So there was a little bit of uh, a loss of inhibition, maybe uh, religiously and in other ways, uh, evidently. And our friend and fellow brother historian Dan Vogel puts it well. He says sure, Mormonism, Mormonism fits well with other new religions at the time. Since there, and, and and call me naive, I I plead guilty, but this th this is new to me. This is not what I was taught in church. We're talking a unique restoration that no one else had and a unique interpretation of scripture that no one else had. And only Joseph Smith was interested in this lost scripture because, of course, that's a Book of Mormon theme. They take crap out of the Bible, and, and now Joseph Smith's going to bring it back through Revelation, of course, and he, he can't rebind the Bible, so he puts it in new books of scripture, and that's where the Book of Enoch comes in. But now we find that the utopianism was not unique. Mm -hmm. The rise of the religions was not unique to Mormonism as a restoration movement. And the interconnection, the inter-argument between 
what the religions were hoping to achieve with not only scripture, but with the society. It's, it's everywhere in Joseph Smith's environment, Doug. Yeah, he's swimming <laughs> in it. He's swimming in it. And, and getting back to education, another thing that I read that, that kind of ties into that is that because there were so many publications being generated along that corridor, it actually forced the population to become more literate because they had to function with all this printed material around them and people were talking about it. And so if you wanted to talk about it, you kind of had to read, right? So uh, you had to read, right? <laughs> but, but yeah, so the, the, uh, the um, literacy level increased in that area because of the canal. So it was not this rural, you know, uh, barefoot kids, you know, going to school for a couple years and then, you know, out on the farm with old Paul, you know, they were, they were learning whether they were in and, school and, and or not. not. Only, and not only that now, uh, what dawns on me while you're, you're talking to is all of the uh, early Mormon uh, people that Joseph Smith was converting, you know, and bringing into the church and all, he was sending them out on missions. Uh, some of them were only a month and, mm -hmm. and some of them went to New York. So they probably went through the Erie Canal and then, oh, yeah. and then uh, out, out West, we know he sent some to the Lamanites, the missionaries to the Lamanites, and he identified the Indians as Lamanites. And so, but, all of those missionaries were coming and going also, and they were saturated with all of this culture. You remember the story of Oren Porter Rockwell that one winter when he finally, he was out of jail. He had been traveling for a month and a half hiding because they had a bounty on his head. And on Christmas Eve, or was it Christmas, he finally got there and knocked on the house the Nauvoo house, the door of the Nauvoo house. And the guy that opened it didn't recognize him. So he thought he was a bum and he was getting ready to kick him out. And Joseph saw him and he goes, Rockwell, Porter Rockwell, come in. But the description was they were all sitting in the Nauvoo house as a group of people drinking the fine wine. They had their elegant silverware and their clothing. I That always struck me as, where did uh, they didn't sew it all or did they but they could certainly be buying it all and exchanging it all yeah. so everything seems to fit that all of joseph smith's associates in the church and out and there were hundreds of them was having access to all this information and bringing it back and forth. How many councils did Joseph Smith set up? We've got the Joseph Smith papers now. Don't kid yourself. We know they were constantly counseling together in groups, 50, 20, 75 here, 200 there. He was holding church conferences, et cetera. Constant, nonstop exchange of information. This is a new, much broader school, picture for school me. School of the Prophets. School of the Prophets, you know. A and wasn't Sidney Rigdon yeah. very intelligent yeah. man? And he brought in his congregation. How about mm -hmm. Oliver Cowdery, the school teacher? Oh, you told me something about Hiram Smith, too, earlier tonight. While yeah, we were yeah. preparing about Hiram. Everybody needs to, to watch the last um, Mormonism Live because it was about Hiram and the educational uh, pursuits of the Smith family, so to speak. But yeah, Hiram went to Dartmouth College for four years, um, had tons of exposure to all kinds of noted people uh, in and around, uh, you know, the Mormon movement uh, and other similar types of things, masonry, et cetera, um, and was there to, Bring all that back to Joseph Smith. I'll bring it all back into the Smith home. The Smith home was not a place of ignorance. It was not. No. no. And, and this all doesn't this also make sense that uh, 
uh, with the with the huge rise of the and and this was nationwide in the size of the nation then with the murder of Dale Morgan, the great anti Masonic movement, hundreds oh, yeah. of newspapers were involved in that discussion. Yeah. Interestingly, Colby Townsend wrote that new research on the Book of Enoch, and he has discovered something remarkably interesting. I took Hugh Nibley at his word. What Nibley did with the discussion and with the debate, which Colby Townsend has found in dozens of newspapers in both uh, Britain, across the ocean, and right in New York and, and elsewhere, right in Joseph Smith's lap of the argument, of the discussion, of, and of course, look, this is a book of scripture that was lost. There were some groups that did not accept that. Nope, the Bible only. But there were lots of other groups who said, but they're lost. We would like to see what they say. Then they had the word of Lawrence's discovery of the book of Enoch in the old world. Now that we know access to that through the channel, across the ocean and through that canal was just a matter of just days. Yeah. They very well, they were debating and arguing about Lawrence's translation and the content of the book of Enoch because they had all the German and French scholars translating as much as they could in the languages. And then it was happening. Yeah. It was occurring here in America. The thing that's interesting is Nibley showed the negative side of that debate, that discussion, I'll say, not necessarily. Well, it was a huge debate. There were people who said, definitely, there were people who said, well, the Book of Enoch, it's not authentic. It's not real. Uh, there's nothing here to look at. Go home. Well, when you pick three or four different scholars, and Nibley did, and he was right. They properly proposed a negative aspect of this. And then Nibley had to, because of his apologetic base and approach, say, see, nobody was even interested in it in the United mm -hmm. States. That's where he overstepped his bound yeah. because the positive side has been discovered by Townsend and it was very large. It was widespread. Now, with you egging me on <laughs> to study this Erie Canal stuff with you, I now get it. It really was widespread, you guys. It was. I'm not just talking maybe in just New York or perhaps New York and, and one or two little small frontier towns that you couldn't get to for six months because they were so far away and hard to arrive at. I mean, within three to five days, it could have gotten all the way to Lake Erie and back and all of those towns in between. And that's where all the newspapers were published. And Colby Townsend has found dozens of discussions in all those newspapers on yeah. this interesting subject. There's with Joseph Smith sending out the missionaries. See, he wasn't the only one interested in this subject. Of course Every not. one of the early Mormon leaders were, of course. Yeah. Sure. Right? So we're talking thousands of people looking into this within Mormonism. Of course Joseph Smith knew about it. Now, now what, what this does, now I'm not using this as proof. What this is doing for us is it is in a very proper Bayesian scientific thought here. This dramatically raises the probability that, yes, Joseph Smith could actually easily have had access to the book. of. You remember when they made such a big deal when they discovered the book of Jasher? I, th I think that was in the 1840s. And that was spread all over in the newspapers, yeah. too. Yeah, it was. And, you know, to me, what it did for me, it was like, okay, it's no longer... Um, could Joseph Smith have had access to this material? It's 
what kind of argument can you make that he didn't? Because he probably did. I mean, there's this means that really nothing was out of reach in his area. Nothing. You know, nothing really was out of reach. So the significant Park commentary have been there. You bet. Book of Enoch stuff. Yeah. Stuff about Egyptian mummies and things like that. Of course. Uh, Egyptomania. That was a big deal. You know, front page news. Uh, he would have been plugged into all that. And he would have felt what was, quote, in the air because it was, quote, in the air everywhere. <laughs> that was, oh, come on, that's my original that. Come Luke. on, we love a rhyme, yeah. <laughs> I'll give you some shirt spear. Okay, now I, I have one last clip, and okay. uh, we, we were going to show this earlier, but let this clip is just remarkable to show these guys were not yeah. professional engineers. Yeah, their yeah. ingenuity is beautiful, though. Yeah, yeah. So, so let me just say something about that. So, absolutely, yeah, it, it was it, not only were they not professional engineers, but they were left, they had nowhere else to go to solve their problems but themselves. And this mm. just shows the ingenuity of those people. Go for it. Yeah, yeah, thank you. That's important, including. The genius of Joseph Smith with putting ideas together, these people put together implements to help them build that canal. Joseph Smith did that intellectually and spiritually with the hundreds of ideas together. Now we get it. It doesn't take away from Joseph Smith. It shows all of these ideas. His conglomeration of them was really powerful. Yeah. To who? His environment, the people around him. No wonder they flocked to him. Fascinating yeah. stuff. Digging a ditch with these requirements, with hand labor, using axes, picks, shovels, and wheelbarrows through hundreds of miles of this primeval forest was the greatest challenge the builders of the Erie Canal would have to confront. The only sources of power were human muscle plus horses and oxen. So they devised ways to increase their efficiency without adding to their workload. These men, who were primarily Irish immigrants, were paid 80 cents a day plus room and board and a daily ration of whiskey. Not a yard of ditch could be dug until the workers had cut down the countless thousands of trees, chopped them up in movable sizes, uprooted the stumps, and then carted away the staggering mess of logs, branches, and leaves. They had to clear mile after mile of woods and fell trees, many of which were six to seven feet in diameter. Regarding those giant trees, for instance, it was not very long before they had one man pulling them over. Someone devised a technique whereby a chain was tied high up in a tree with the other end leading to a wheel, which was controlled by a woodsman with an endless screw gear. As the woodsman wound the gear with a crank, the tree was very slowly pulled over with irresistible force until the cable bent the tree so far it finally broke free of its stump and crashed to the ground. Stumps still in the earth remained a challenge until some unsung genius came up with a stump pulling device shown here that was as effective as it was simple. It had two tremendous wheels, 16 feet in diameter on the ends of a very sturdy axle, 30 feet long. Fixed at the center of the axle was a slightly smaller wheel, about 14 feet in diameter, with a broad rim which held a coiled rope. This strange looking machine was hauled into place so it straddled the stump 
and the big outer wheels were tied down to hold it steady. A chain wound around the axle was tied to the stump. A team of horses was hitched at the end of a rope wound around the rim of the middle wheel. And as the animals moved forward, pulling the rope behind them and turning the wheel, the tremendous pressure on the chain yanked the stump and its roots free of the earth. Seven men and two horses could pull 30 to 40 stumps in one day with this rig. Another to me, that was one of the most that this was the play. Now, now there's several videos who show a lot of the other types of equipment they use to, they cleared lots of forest. They had to get rid of a lot of rock, etc. So they really had to come up with interesting inventions. The reason those wheels were so big, I saw a couple comments in the chat while this was playing, is because remember, some of those trees are six feet in diameter. We're talking major forest here not like the forest we have today no. we're talking seriously gigantic trees and they had to have seriously gigantic machines to pull those stumps but so this is kind of an interest in the in in americana in american history and and uh we we uh could succeed with people who band together find solutions to issues that they needed to even only at 80 cents a day for brutal hard work 14 hours a day you can see why various groups got together re religiously or socioeconomically and stuck together and by innovating doctrine that they were discovering new discoveries from Egypt, et cetera, this book of Enoch, by because everyone wanted to know what does it say? What is it about? So come on. Of course Joseph Smith's going to get a revelation and put it in his scripture. That truly is no longer ridiculous to me. As an apologist, I used to ridicule really the critics on that. Now that you've helped me understand this extra broad context, shoes on the other foot. It's, it's just so fascinating to me, Doug. So I am so grateful you kept needling me and nagging me a bit and giving me a call saying, hey, I found something else. You might want to take a look at this, you know. This this has been a boatload of fun for me. I learned a lot, too. I mean, I it started with just a little memory, you know, and it's like, what was that? And you start researching and all of a sudden it's like, like when you have a thread coming out of a sweater and you start pulling and, <laughs> you know, it never stops. <laughs> and then you told me earlier too, uh, Brigham Young, before he was a Mormon, actually yeah. painted those boats. Yeah. So, yeah. So let's go back to just a little bit of Mormon history. Yeah. Uh, Brigham Young and his family moved in 1804 to New, uh, Western New York and uh, Brigham Young uh, was 16 years old at the time, and he left the family pretty soon after that. But he went to work on the canal when it started going, and he was he was a, a painter. He painted the boats, the canal boats. Yeah. Um, later, um, that canal would be used by the Smiths when they left New York and went to Kirtland. Because guess what? You go over here, you get on Lake Erie, you go down a little bit, and, and there's there Kirtland. It it's right there's near the Kirtland. Lake. You know, that, that is so, so fantastic. I, yeah. I, I left out one of the clips that I didn't get loaded up, darn it, um, where one of the uh, inventions that they had to come up with was waterproof cement. Yeah, waterproof cement. And yeah. they were able to do that in that day. I, it's, yeah. it's, just, it's just so fun. It's so yeah. incredible. Yeah, it was a, a kind of a magical uh, event you know, and time in our history, in American history, where everything kind of coalesced, came together for that particular uh, feat to be accomplished. But then we also get a much clearer picture of all the other things that transpired that it triggered, 
you know, that it was mm -hmm. a catalyst for all these religious movements. And uh, the canal was used by those, you know, the burned over district. They talked about that. Uh, mm -hmm. Preachers would go up and down the canal preaching, you know, it gave this platform basically for these preachers to go out and preach their own version of the gospel. Yeah. And it, it gave a lot of people uh, ideas and maybe some freedom from the bigger organized, organized religion to come up with new ideas for religion. So it was, uh, you know, an agent of change in, in a whole lot of ways. And yeah. especially the church. Um, and um, we're not taught about it. We don't learn a thing about it. Uh, I didn't know any of this two weeks ago, man. Yeah. So, so hope the hope you guys in the audience have appreciated the work that Doug put into this, and and I actually did quite a bit of work in this too. Um, we have just had a ball. We will be doing more shows together. Uh, we we have other subjects that we really want to explore together, and so through time this year, we will definitely be getting back together and doing some more shows. So. Thank you for everybody showing up. We're going to call it good. And we love y'all. And sure remember, did. be good, do well, have fun, work hard, sleep good, make lots of friends. And don't forget Steve Hartman on the road Friday nights. It's the best part of the news hour. I'm not kidding. I love that man's story. Look him up and see. We need more kindness in our world. And I think as we put it all together with all of us, we can do it. So thank you Bye, for everybody. showing up. We are going to take the night off from here out. <laughs>